seated. Good morning. I don't know about you guys, but my heart is burdened by what I'm seeing going on in our world, in our nation. And I would love for nothing more than for the church to rise up and have a voice and teach the world what it's all about. And I think that's what's happening among churches, uh, even as I was called by one of our uh, uh, a sister church down in South Florida, you know, just asking what, what is uh, my view, my take on all that's going on. And uh, so I had uh, an interesting conversation, and I, I poured my heart out. <laughs> of all that was on my heart, and I'm trying to use my words wisely uh, because I know the enemy have a way of taking what we, what we said and twisting it and turning it. And I just want to share just something really quick from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. And this was the word that was just on my heart this morning. Just these first words, now I plead with you. That's the word that the Lord put on my heart. And so I, I just want to read the remainder of what it says here. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you shall speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the, in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me discerning you, my brethren, by those of Cleo's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you say, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? You know, the world is doing what they're doing because they're the world. But when it comes to the church, well, we're the church, we're different. We, we are citizens of heaven before we are citizens of this nation. And my heart is broken because this is my home. And just to see all that's going on, you know, I, I feel like our nation is dying. And uh, the only cure, I believe, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, as Paul pleaded with the church I plead as well with you, don't get caught up. And I'll even say this, I plead with you, because even as I, I avoid watching the news on purpose, but this past week I had a glimpse just for about 15, 20 minutes of it, and I just was like, so I'm pleading with you, turn it off. You know why? Because it brings about anxiety and it brings about division. And what, it, what they are trying to do is manipulate people to take sides, and what we're doing, we're destroying each other. We're destroying ourselves. And just to speak to, again, a brother uh, from South Florida that has a predominantly white church, and uh, he, he, doesn't, he does not know what to do because he feels like, well, the, the church, they're starting to get division among them. And I, I, I know our church, and we're not like that, but I just want to caution us, don't get caught up. Let's rise above the noise and let's be a beacon of light and show the world what true love is. They can't love like we love because they don't have Christ. And we can't expect them to love like we love because sometimes even with us, we struggle with that type of love. And whatever is going on in our hearts, in our world, we always have to go back to the scripture and say, what would Jesus do? What does the scripture say? And find the answers there. And I believe that will be what will change this whole thing uh, that we're going through. Well, I say that, and before I even say good morning, <laughs> I just have to get that off my chest. Of course, I have a whole lot more to say, but I'm reserving that for the time when the Lord will have me speak. Um, but I want to welcome those uh, that are online. If you are here, you can feel free to take out your phone and, and uh, join us on Facebook. To invite your friends and your family uh, to join us for this word today. Um, also, if you are interested in giving to this church, we want to encourage you 
oh my goodness, I'm sorry. I just saw a brother that just walked into the church and he's been missing for a while. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Welcome back, brother. <laughs> so as I was saying, if you want to give, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So you can go online, ccfjacks.org forward slash give. Uh, and um, yeah, let me just also say this. This past week, I've been going through this little thing. We've been robbed. From, uh, someone wrote $5,000 worth of checks from Orlando. And so I've been dealing with the FBI and police and writing reports and all of that. And so um, we'll, we'll be taken care of. God is, is not broke. You know, he's, 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 he, he got this. But just to the, the deal with just the, the evil intent of men, you know, that they will steal from a church, they will steal from a, a widow. They, it's, just, it's just evil. And that's the world that we live in. And that's why I believe that the Lord's return is near. Amen. It, it's getting darker and darker. Every year it's getting darker and darker. And so our hope is in Christ. Our hope is in the Lord. And I, I hope that's where your eyes are on. Because he said, when you see these things happening, look up. That's where our redemption comes from. Amen. So um, nothing new in the way of announcements. Again, we're still praying about our children ministry starting up, our youth ministry. We're still praying about that, hopefully, in July, we're going to be, you know, looking at, you know, possibly opening some of those things. Uh, we're still praying for those our brothers and sisters who are unable to join us. Uh, this morning, I was just thinking about um, um, Brother Thomas, uh, Tommy, and, um, you know, with him having that kidney transplant. He's, you know, he, he have to be very careful. And for some of us, we, we're healthy and, and all of that, and so we can come to church. Uh, but let's not forget for those who who are unable to, and, you know, coming here can be a, a, a big risk for them. And so just keep uh, our brothers and sisters in prayer. Um, let's turn to Acts chapter 8, excuse me, Acts chapter 9, as we go through verse by verse through the book of Acts. You know, again, the Word of God is timely. Whatever we're dealing with in life, it always has the answer. And so just want to continue to encourage you, grab your Bible every day and read it. As they say, the, a, 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 a chapter a day keeps the devil away, right? The devil cannot mess with God's people when they're equipped with God's word. And so keep that in mind. Keep your word near. Keep your sword in your hand and be prepared for battle. So we are in Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at the first 30 verses. And if you have your spot, let us pray. Jesus, Jesus, <laughs> that name, that precious name, that powerful name, that name that brings salvation to all men who will believe. And Lord, that name brings to us life. It brings to us health and healing and direction. It brings to us all that we need. Lord, we give you honor and praise, and we ask that as we open your word, Lord, that you will open our hearts, and that, uh, Lord, that you will lead us and guide us, Lord, that you will bring us closer together as a body, as a, a people. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. It has been said that the people who are most uh, against God, who, who, who shows the most anger and frustration against God and against the church, those are the ones, believe it or not, that are closest to salvation. <laughs> you see, when God, the hound of heaven, is after someone, oftentimes they are running and they are fighting with him. And that will be the case as we look at Acts chapter 9. It says, then Saul, still breathing and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked a letter from him to the synagogue of Damascus so that it, if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. We have here in our text today, Saul, the bounty hunter. 
Saul is, as it says here, he's still breeding threats. This young man thought that he was on a mission from God to murder Christians, to arrest them wherever they are, in homes, in synagogues, wherever they, he, he will find them. He will arrest them, and some he put to death, as he did with, if you remember, in a couple of chapters before, in chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 7, Steve, uh, uh, the, the, the brother Stephen, first, one of the first deacons, he was stoned to death by the order of this young man named Saul. Now Saul, as it says here, that he was asking for letters from the synagogue. He was traveling outside of Jerusalem, all the way north to the, the, Damascus, to arrest Christians wherever they, they were. Now, I believe Saul was under conviction. If you think about it, well, the saying goes that if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one that cry yelp, that yelps the loudest is the one that gets hit, right? And so when, when, when Stephen, if you think about Stephen's last words, listen to his last words in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, when he was being stoned by the order of Saul, it says, he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. You see, Saul was ordering that Stephen be stoned. And even then, what was Stephen doing? He wasn't cursing. He wasn't fighting back. He was praying that God will forgive them. Even as Jesus from the cross saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Now, I want to say this again. Don't get me wrong. I, this is just in, in light of illustration. If you think about George Floyd's last words, I think we all know it. I can't breathe. Right? What does that word, that, that sentence do to you? It's, it's stuck in our minds. That image, that, 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 that saying is stuck in our minds. And, and what does it do to us? Well, for some people, well, we see what's going on in our, in our country as some people are rising up and they're rioting. Oh, they're angry. They're frustrated. We're going to do something about this. But can I say there are still others who heard those same words, and what are they doing? They're returning to the same city corner, the same street where George Floyd died, and what, what are they doing there? They're baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, the same words, they just have different effects on people. You see, Paul, excuse me, Saul, probably had those words in his mind as, as, as uh, Stephen said, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. As he is so angry at this young man, Stephen, and, and stoning him, he, he's probably hearing those words everywhere he's, he's going, and he's trying to silence the voice. He's trying to silence it by doing what? Silencing every voice that preaches the name of Jesus Christ. He does not want to remember those words. Why? I believe that he is convicted. He is convicted. You see, every one of us, before we came to Christ, Christ convicts us of our sins. You see, that's where salvation has to begin with the conviction of our sins. You know, there are those who will say, oh, you know, Jesus wants to save you and he wants to give you a life, but they never talk about the conviction of sin. You see, we all need to know that we're sinners. And that's what he was hearing that he was a sinner as he was stoning Stephen. Father, forgive him for his sins. That's what he heard. And, and so he tries to, to clear his conscience. But you see, when he was convicted, listen, he also had to be confronted. Look at verse 3 now. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly, I want to underline suddenly, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven then he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul was, was executing his plan. <laughs> and then suddenly, what happened? This light came from heaven, and he was blinded. He fell to the ground. I want to, again, pay attention to that word, suddenly. 
In other words, without warning. Saul th thought he was doing a good job. He thought, he thought he was serving God. He was on a mission from God. And without warning, now here comes Jesus, the one who he is fighting against, is confronting him face to face. You see, the same is true again today. That, 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 that the Lord suddenly gets our attention. You know, for me personally, it was when, you know, I was living life. I was young and, and wild and crazy. And it, was un it wasn't until at that time, my wife and I dating, and, and, and she dumped me. <laughs> How could she? The greatest man in the world. <laughs> and she got rid of me. And it broke my heart. And I felt like, what's the purpose of living? Listen, it was suddenly the Lord got my attention. Because I was asking that question, what is the purpose of my life? And it was at then that the Lord started to minister to me. He started shining the light in my face and shining it in my heart. And it was then that I became aware of who he is and what his plans are. You see, sometimes the Lord has to use even tragedy. For some, it might be, well, a, a, a sickness, a, a loss of a loved one, a, 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 an accident, something that the Lord, you know, you're going along in life. Life is good. Life is great. And then all of a sudden, the Lord confronts you. And you're wondering, what, what is life all about? Why is this happening? And it's then that the Lord begins to minister to you. I think most people come to the Lord because of some kind of trial or tragedy in their lives. When life is good and, and you're, you're partying and, oh, you're not thinking about the Lord. But it's when he confronts us, then it is that we say, Lord. And look at verse 5. And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It's, it, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. You see, goads are these pointed sticks, these long pointed sticks that farmers used to use when they're, they're plowing their fields and they have an ox that's tied to this plow and they want the ox to go forward. And if the ox is lazy, what he will do is take that, that stick, that goad, and he will poke it in the rear end. <laughs> and, the, and the ox will begin to go forward. But you see, a, a stubborn or a foolish ox would do what? Kick against it and only to injure itself. And the Lord is saying to Saul, you are kicking against me. And what you don't realize is that you're injuring yourself. You see, God is, is working in every one of us. He's trying to get us along the way to get us on the path that he wants us to be. And sometimes he will tell us to do something that we just don't want to do and instead of giving in and going along, we're kicking and screaming and fighting only to injure ourselves. And let me say this, and you still wouldn't have to do it eventually. So might as well you give in. Saul, you're fighting with me. You, you might as well give up because it's just a matter of time that you will. And so he said in verse 6, so he trembled and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. You see, for all of Saul's life, he's been a religious person. He was born in Judaism. He was a Jew of Jew. He, he was proud of his pedigree. And he had this religion that he thought he had a connection with God through the laws of Moses, only to realize here that he didn't have a relationship with him. He didn't hear the voice of God like we hear the voice of God because why? Because of what Jesus did on the cross, him dying on the cross, we now have this relationship with him. And so as Paul now, he is trembling, he has fear, and now he is praying this prayer to the Lord saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Can I say this? That's the best prayer we could pray. <laughs> on a daily basis, Lord, what do you want me to do? Sometimes we open his word and we read his word, but do we ask that question? Okay, Lord, in light of your word, what do you want me to do? Is it to forgive someone? Is it to go and, and feed someone or buy 
uh, a, a lunch for someone and share the gospel? What is it that you want me to do? That's a great prayer. And I think far too often, instead of coming to God and saying, God, what do you want me to do? What do we do? We come to God with our list. Lord, this is what I want you to do. Lord, zap that person. Take them out. <laughs> I don't like that person. Whatever. And we give, them, give him this long list and say, all right, I'll be back tomorrow. Make sure that it's all checked and done. No, who's in charge? See, Saul went around probably telling people, you need to do this and you need to do that. And look at what it says here. And the Lord said, I want you to go to the city and you will be told what to do. You see, that's a great position to be. Lord, tell me what to do. You're the one to lead me and guide me. You see, if we truly believe God's word, we will do what he says. We will ask him. Because what, what, what does Romans 12 two say? Romans 12 two says, uh, that, that God's plan for us is, listen, good, acceptable, and perfect. Again, good, acceptable, and perfect. So instead of us getting up every day and saying, God, this is my plan, <laughs> be like, no, God, what is your plan? Because I know it's good, it's good for me, it's perfect, and it's acceptable. In other words, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I know it will, I will accept it because it's good for me. And so he tells him to go to the city and wait for orders. And in verse 7, it says, And the man who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there, he was three days without sight, and, and neither ate nor drank. You see, Saul was once walking with his physical eyes, but he was spiritually blind. You see, sight, when we, we are told in the scripture that we are to walk by faith and not by sight, Sight is, is what we do when we look with our physical eyes, when we, we go around with our emotions and our feelings and what we think. That's dependent upon our sight. That's as the, the scripture, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, uh, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own sight, what you see and feel and think. Don't depend upon those things. They're, they're limited, but instead, we are to do what? Walk in faith. And as Paul would be led by the hand, he is, be, he is now being, being told where to go and what to do. And listen, he is listen or living a life of faith now for the first time. Before, it was all about what he can see and think and feel and do. But now it's, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to speak to? Uh, how, how should I go? How should I do? You see, he was living a life of faith. And that is, let me remind you, Christian, that's the life that we're called to live. A life of faith, not by sight, not by feelings. You know, every time something happens to you and I, what, what's the initial thing that happened? Our feelings come about. Our emotions take control. And what are we to do? Submit it to the Word of God. Go back to the Word of God. God, I feel this way, but here's what your word says, so I will do what your word says. That's what we need to do. If we're led by the Spirit, we will not gratify the, the, the flesh. We will not make those foolish decisions that we make only to regret it. We won't say those words that, that are hurtful only to regret saying it. And even though you say, I'm sorry, guess what? It still left the wound. And so the Bible is filled as we even looked at on Wednesday, looking at Proverbs, oh, if we can just go through some of the Proverbs and gain some wisdom. A fool, it says, vents his anger. A wise man holds his tongue. See, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. All those things are in God's word. And so instead of reacting and re responding in a flesh, we are to respond by faith. God, I'm going to trust you. Whatever your word says, I'm going to do what your word says because I know when I do what your word says, it will, re it will bring about a righteous uh, a, a, um, outcome. And that's what we want. You guys agree with me? Amen. 
Can I get an amen? All right, you're with me. Praise the Lord. I'm not by myself. <laughs> Feels good. So he, in verse 10, says here, Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. You know, there's this old... Uh, if you guys remember that old Uncle Sam Wants You poster. I, how many of you remember that poster? I think most of us that are above 20 years old know it. I'm 25. Some of I'm lying from the pulpit. Sorry about that. Sorry. But, you know, we know that poster, Uncle Sam Wants You. And I think in the same way God is saying, God wants you. To do what? Just like with Ananias. Ananias, <laughs> I, need your, I need you to serve me. And Ananias, his, his response is, Lord, here I am. You know? Hey, here I am. If we would just answer to the Lord when he calls us, here I am, Lord. I'm available to you. Is that our response? Or are we trying to run from the Lord? <laughs> Lord, not right now. I'm busy. Lord, I, I don't know. What you, what's you, what you trying to send me to do? I don't know if your plans are good for me. He, he says, here I am. And what a wonderful response. And that's how we should be, but here's the deal. So the Lord said in verse 11, said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying, and in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in, in and pull, put in his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord... I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind or to arrest all who call on your name. So God, I, I love this. If you, if you look at these verses, you're going to notice a couple of names that's noteworthy. We see in there it have the name Judas. We also see the name Saul, and we see the name Ananias. These are all names we have read in previous chapters because, well, in the Gospels, we know there's one named Judas. And Judas was the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And here it is, God is saying, Ananias, I want you to go to Judas. Not the same Judas, but someone named Judas. How many of you today, if you were to have a child, a son, would name him Judas? Not a one. I, 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 I was right. Why? Because you see, the thing that Judas did spoiled that name. But then we also have the other person, which is Ananias, his name in the earlier chapters. What did Ananias do? Ananias and Sapphira, what did they, what did they do? They lied to the Holy Spirit. So that name was tainted. But then we also have the other name, Saul, as Ananias said, this guy was bringing harm to the church. He was arresting people. Oh, three bad names. But what is the Lord doing? He's restoring those names. He's restoring those names. It doesn't matter who you are and what your past was. God wants to restore you. It doesn't matter what sin you committed. God wants to restore you. And so here we see he's saying, go uh, to Saul because Saul already have this vision that you're coming. He knows you by name. And you're going to pray for him so that he can receive his sight. So verse 15, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a, he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him, listen, how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You see, this is so, so flies in the, in the face of so many teachers today that say, if you give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to live happily ever after here on earth. <laughs> no, you're going to suffer. The reality, the moment that you give your life to Christ, you have a big bullseye on your chest, and the devil want to take you out. <laughs> Because when you, when you speak about the Lord and you try to get people into the kingdom, the devil won't like that. So what he's going to do, he's going to attack you. 
And so the Lord is going to send him on a mission, but the devil would also be on a mission to take him out, to try to destroy his mission. But notice again those words that the Lord said about Saul, that he is a chosen vessel. Chosen vessel. You see, it's a choice that God makes, and I believe that every one of us, young or old, uh, you know, uh, every one of us, God has chosen us. Why? Because we are his vessels. What is a vessel? You see that word vessel? It speaks of, well, back in those days, they had a lot of clay pots, common clay pots. They were numerous. They put water, they put wine, they put all kinds of things in clay pots, and they were all over the place. And so when it falls, guess what? It gets cracked. So you have a lot of cracked pots. <laughs> and you see, that's what some of us were, cracked pots, common vessels. And I want to point this out to you. Why is God choosing Saul and not someone else? You see, because Saul is a vessel just like every one of us. God doesn't choose, and he, he does, but he, he doesn't choose all the the wealthy people of the world or the, the dignitaries of the world or, or any of that. He chose common people to do what? To meet or reach common people, right? That's what he does. He, he, every one of you here probably have been brought here by someone else. So every one of us here have been brought to the Lord by someone else, a common person, right? And so God wants to use Saul to reach, as he says here, Gentiles, you know, that means anyone that's not a Jew. He wants to spread the gospel to other common people, but also to kings, to dignitaries, and also the children of Israel. You see, his ministry was far, goes far and wide, and that's the same for us today. God wants to use us as we go to our workplace, as we are in our neighborhoods, whoever is around us, God wants to use us to reach other people. You see, every one of us, and even Saul, will share his story. We're going to read this a couple of times, and he's going to share his testimony. Let me tell you the life I used to live, and let me tell you how I live now. And that's for every one of us. Let me tell you about my life, how I used to live, B.C., before Christ. But let me tell you how I live now. And that's Paul's testimony, and every one of us have a testimony I used to be a cracked pot, <laughs> and God made me whole. And so verse 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, I love this, <laughs> Brother Saul, not enemy Saul, not you murderer Saul, but brother. You see, every one of us are brothers and sisters from another mother. We're all in Christ. We're not of the world. We used to be of the world, but now we are in Christ. We are one. We are brothers and sisters. Let's not forget that. When we fight with each other, because we will fight, we won't fight like the world. We'll kiss and make up afterwards. We'll greet each other with holy hugs after the fact. Hey, let's, let's move on, right? We, we don't throw stones and we don't stab at each other. We continue to love one another. So he said, Brother Saul, uh, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from the, his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciple at Damascus. Now, as Ananias went there to Saul, of course, here we see him ministering to Saul, telling him the message. But I believe at this moment, Saul was born again. Saul was born again because the the, the scales were, fought, were, were came off of his eyes. In other words, he now can see spiritually, not only physically, but spiritually as well. He was rebirth. He had a rebirth uh, into a spiritual birth. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter in the kingdom of heaven. 
You know, before I became born again, I was blind. I remember when I was young, my mom would say, Alan, read the Bible. And I'll read a couple of chapters and think, I didn't get anything from it. It didn't make any sense. How many of you have had that before? Some of you are probably still saying it. I don't make any sense to me. Please explain. That's understandable. But you see, before Christ, it made absolutely no sense. It, it, I can't remember anything that I read. I walk away just as if I had never read it before. But the moment that I became born again, it was as if, just as Paul, it says, that scales were fo- fell from his eyes. Listen, my eyes were open, and I couldn't put down the word of God. It was different. I saw things that I just would have not, never seen before uh, had I not been born again. And so if you're, 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 you, you haven't given your life to the Lord and you're saying, well, this Christian thing, I, I, I'm checking it out, but it makes no sense. Listen, you're waiting for God to open up heaven and say, here I am. You know, I'm, I'm real for you to believe. Listen, no, believe and then you will see. Walk in faith. Just say, God, I, I want to I see you reveal yourself to me in your word as I give your, my life to you. And listen, he will show you, he will reveal himself. And so Saul now is born again. His eyes are open. And look at verse 20. Immediately he preached the Christ in the synagogue that he is the son of God. When did he preach Christ? Immediately. You know, the first thing that you should do if you're born again, really, it should go and tell somebody about Christ. Just go say, hey, I I don't know what this all means. I'm still making sense of it. But yesterday or or earlier today, I went to church and I gave my life to the Lord and, and, and he's changed me. I know I'm changed. Share that with someone. Don't go hide. And I remember when I became born again, I was so ashamed of the behavior of believers, of Christians before, you know, that I knew before that I didn't want to be called a Christian until the Lord convicted me and said, Alan, you be the best Christian. Be a good witness for me. And so I put on that Christian badge and say, you know what? I will, Lord. I take on that challenge. And so he confessed Christ. He preached Christ in a synagogue that what? He is the Son of God. You see, that term... Son of God, it's so limited in our English language because we just think, well, Jesus must be uh, a son of God, just like you and I, we are sons and daughters of God. No, it's not the same. You see, Jesus was stoned, or excuse me, was, was um, crucified because he claimed to be the son of God. What's so wrong with saying, I'm a child of God? Listen, it's different. You see, because when you say that you are a son of God, when Jesus said it, He was saying that I am equal with the Father. We are one, as he said in John 17. And so Paul, excuse me, Saul, he is uh, preaching the very thing that he was trying to stop people from preaching. He was trying to tell them, convince them now that Jesus is the Son of God. But look at the confusion of the crowd in verse 21. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for the purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? You see, Paul, Saul, I keep saying Paul, he will be changed to Paul, but right now he's still Saul. Uh, and So his reputation had already reached a city where he is... Uh, people are aware that he came to Damascus for the very reason to arrest Christians, persecute them, throw them in prison, and here he is. They're confused. Who is this guy anyway? Is he a pro, uh, you know, uh, 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 one who persecuted the church, or is he part of the church? They're they're confused, and so, you know, as as you see this confusion starting to happen. You know, and I believe the reason why is because they, they have yet to see the fruit of Paul's life. In other words, they, they, his reputation is there that he was a Christian persecutor. Now he's preaching, which is wonderful, but no one has seen the fruit, so no one really knows who he is. You know, John the Baptist says that 
when you repent, they need to be fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, people will look at our life and say, something is different about you. And it takes a little while before people realize who you are. Notice that when you become a, a born again, you don't really fit in with Christians because they don't trust you. Ah, you still, got, you still, still smell like alcohol, you know, or whatever. Uh, you still have that bad reputation, right? You don't fit in with Christians, but you don't, no longer fit in with your friends because now when you get around your friends and they're cursing and you're just like, can you not curse? What are you talking about, right? They, you, you, they, they haven't, you haven't developed that reputation of being a Christian, and so he's not fitting in with those who he once hanged out with. But look at uh, verse 22 now. Satan is not going to be happy with what Saul is doing. So verse 22, but Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that that this Jesus is the Christ. Now, after many days were passed, the Jews, they plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the, the disciples took him by night and led him down through the wall in a large basket. So here it is that Saul, when he was persecuting the church, the Jews... They were happy with him. They were best friends, you know. We are good. We're buddies. But the moment that, that Saul started to preach a different, uh, you know, language, a different message, they are now trying to take him out. They're trying to kill him. You know, I watched this movie last night, and I encourage you, write it down. Watch it. It's available if you have it um, on, on uh, Amazon Prime. But it's called Unplanned. It's, a, it's an abortion movie, and it's really well done. It's actually based on a true story of a, a, a Planned Parenthood abortion um, um, what's it, office manager. I forget her title. But she, did, she was responsible for encouraging 22,000 abortions until the Lord arrested her heart and turn her around, and now she's an advocate, you know, for the unborn. But the very organization that she once worked for, they turned against her and wanted to destroy her, took her to court. You see, that's how the enemy works, and it's so interesting that the people that were on the other side of the fence that were praying for her, right, praying that she will open up her eyes and, and, and stop what she was doing, they became her advocate and say, you know what, uh, we're with you. We're going to help you find a job. We'll help you get up on your feet if you get out of that industry. But here it is that the enemy, the devil, whenever you profess Christ, he's going to attack you. He's going to come after you through your wife, your husband, your children, your boss, your co-workers. You name it. He's going to send people to discourage you and destroy you. As the scripture says, that it's thief, he comes to kill, steal, and destroy and so in verse 26, and when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So here it is, again, his, his countrymen, his own Jewish brothers and sisters, they were not accepting him. But now in the church, they're not accepting him because they can't see past his previous life. They only knew him as Saul. They only knew him as a Christian persecutor. What is Saul to do? But that's where we see the encouragement or the confidence of Barnabas. Remember Barney? Listen, verse 27. And Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples, and he declared to them how he had, been, uh, how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus Verse 28, so he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. And he spoke boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and dispute against the Hellenists, but they attempted to kill him. When, he, when, when the brethren found out, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him to Troas. So here is Barnabas. Remember, his name means sons of encourager, encouragement. Barnabas saw the potential in Saul. 
He saw that he was a young Christian, a young believer, and he needed some guidance. He needed some discipleship. And it's so sad in the church, oftentimes what we do when we see a young Christian, listen, they're not going to have it all together. Just like we that's been walking with the Lord, we don't have it all together. We just, uh, you know, are better at hiding our sins, <laughs> right? But for the young believer that, that just came to the Lord, they, they say the wrong things. They might have a foul language. They still may be drinking. They may still have the, the, the residue of the world. And what do we do? Well, oh, look at them. They call themselves a Christian. I don't know if they're really born again, right? And we criticize them instead of coming along and doing what? Like Barnabas, throwing an arm around them and saying, hey, bro, come on. Let, let's sit down. Let's talk about the Lord. Let's, let, me, let me talk to you about the struggles that you have. Let me help you along. That is what Christian discipleship is all about. It's not about criticizing. Because again, if we just are to take back or pull back the curtains of your life, will you be ashamed? I think we all will. We all have those areas. And so instead of criticizing, man, let's encourage one another. Anyone can criticize. Anyone can condemn. But it takes a Barnabas, a son of encourager, encouragement, to come along and say, let me sit down with you and let's talk about it. You see, every one of us need to be disciples. When you look at Jesus' disciples, he didn't pick perfect men. He, he picked a whole lot of ragtag guys, tax collectors, in other words, IRS agents, thieves, <laughs> Uh, fishermen, men that were filthy language, that probably even had a bad body order. You know, they've come to church and you'd be like, right, let's go to the next row. <laughs> These are the guys he picked. And what did he do? He discipled them. He made them more into his image. And that's what we're called to do. Help people along and make them into his image. I want to close with this thought. If Saul were to come to this church, would we have accepted him? If you think about his resume, a church, a Christian killer, the one who killed, uh, you know, young Stephen, what would we do? Oh, he deserved to die. You see, Saul, in a sense, was a hardened criminal. He had a hard heart. As we look at this world that we live in, there are a lot of hard-hearted people out there. And how are we to change their heart? Listen, we need to confront them with Christ. They need to be convicted of their sin and confront them with Christ. Sit them down with Saul back in those days and say, Saul, let's reason together. Christianity is good. Saul would have none of it. He would take them out. But after Saul is converted, what is he doing? Now he's preaching. He's now useful in the hands of God. And if we want to see this world, this country that we live in change, we need to preach Christ. Again, if every one of us this week would just reach one person, if everyone in the church nationwide would just reach one person, how different will this world be? But again, 90% of born-again believers will never share their faith. 90%. What if 90% share their faith? What if we reach those who are like Saul? What if we reach all those young people who are out in the streets rioting and vandalizing? What if we reach those people? Again, just reading the article this week, I was blessed to see baptisms in the middle of the street where this, young, this, this, uh, this guy lost his life. What if we get people right there and save them, turn their life, and instead of being a, a rioter, a persecutor, now they're a soldier for Christ, preaching Jesus Christ. You see, I, I believe, again, we're in a world that's dying, and it, the world is like a big ship that's, that's sinking, and what we need to do today is save souls. That's the answer. What is the answer to the riots? Saving souls. What's the answer to those who are in the police force that, 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 are, that are bad? Save souls. Jesus Christ. You, you name the sin, it's the same answer. It's the same medicine, Jesus Christ. So let's preach Jesus. Don't, don't preach any other thing. If you preach any other thing, you're going to lose. It's just going to lead to more, more frustration. 
In these past couple weeks, have we seen any results? No, it hasn't changed anything. But I'll tell you what, some lives have been changed. People have come to know Christ and they will never be the same. You guys agree? Yes. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we know that only you can change even a hardened heart like Saul. And there are many like him today in our world that some of them even believe that the, the thing that they're doing, the evil that they're doing, they think that your hand of approval is upon it. But Lord, we know that you didn't come to kill and destroy. You came to bring salvation to those who are lost, those who are hurting. And Lord, there are many who are hurting. I know that there are those who are bitter as they look back to the years of, of slavery way in the past, and they're, they're bitter because of that, and people are using that today to stir up feelings and emotions and hatred. Lord, we know that the answer to all of this is you. And so, Lord, even as you poured out your spirit on Saul and sent him now out, you're going to send him out to be a preacher to the world, to the Gentiles, I pray that you pour your spirit upon us, your church. Lord, that we will be ambassadors for Christ, going out and reconciling the world to God, even as you reconcile us to him, that we will have that ministry of reconciliation. Lord, I know your heart is broken because all of these things that's happened and all these people that are doing the things that they're doing, Lord, you died for them. So, Lord, as you died for them, as you died for us, I pray that we will rise up, that we'll go out and share your word, share your truth. But, Lord, if there's anyone today that still are walking in darkness, they're eyes are blinded, they have scales upon it. If there's anyone that don't know you, that if they were to die today, that they don't have that peace, knowing that they have salvation, Lord, I pray that as your word declares that today is the day of salvation, that that person will make a decision today to give their life to you. And if there's anyone here, or whether you are online listening, if that speaks to you, if you know that's that the Lord is knocking on your heart. He's confronting you right now. Again, the Bible says that we all are sinners and we need a Savior. If you are here or listening and you know that's speaking to you, I, I simply ask those of you who are here to raise your hands. Say, I, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. And if that's you, I'll pray this prayer with you. The prayer is... A simple prayer that we, we refer to as the sinner's prayer. It is really just acknowledging that you are a sinner and that Jesus is who he is. He is the Christ, as Paul preached, the Savior, the Messiah, and that he wants to save you, give you a life, a hope, a future with him in heaven. If that's you, I want to lead you into this prayer. And if you just pray it out loud, that he may hear you, that we may agree with you. We pray this prayer. Let it be your words from your heart. Lord God, I invite you inside to be my Lord, to be my Savior, and to be my friend. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. For I've decided this day to follow you, Jesus. From this day and forever, I'm yours. I'm yours in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, listen, if you have prayed that prayer, let someone know. Let one of us know that one of the elders here, uh, that we may encourage you. If you have prayed and maybe you're watching online, let us know. Send us a, an email, info at ccfjacks.org. Say, hey, I've, I've given my life to the Lord. Uh, or connect with us through our Facebook. 
our website, whatever way, just let us know so we can uh, just continue to encourage you and be a Barnabas in your life to encourage you in your walk with Christ. And those of you who are here, uh, as we close, if you want to stand. You know, over the past months, things have changed. And we're coming back to church. And my prayer is that we will not come back to things as they were. I'm hoping that the Lord will stir us up and light a fire on us that we may be uh, agents of change in this world. And so I'm hoping that we don't just come back here and just say, I'm just coming to to warm up a a pew for uh, an hour on Sunday morning and go back to to life as as it used to be. No, listen, recognize the the times that we're in. Look at the signs. Let's be busy about our Lord business. Amen? Hey, listen, God bless you guys. I, I'm glad to see you guys here and uh, to worship with you. And uh, I just pray that you have a wonderful week. God bless.